Hi, I'll be uh, mercifully brief in my role as discussant. Um, I, I want to say I have almost nothing to say about uh, Lee's uh, uh, comments because I agree with just about everything he says. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but the, the first two uh, contributions I do have some uh, differences with, which I'd like to uh, bring forward and perhaps we can discuss them. I will say it was a relief uh, to hear about the importance of states uh, and not to hear yet another fantasy about how the Globalization is rendered the state irrelevant. States are extremely important and will remain so for as long as anyone can imagine. Um, but the idea that British dominance uh, is not repeatable uh, when applied to the United States uh, strikes me as a little strange. Uh, the American empire, I think, has been an extraordinarily successful one for the past 50, 60 years. Uh, an empire of a new kind, not like the old model of uh, territorial ownership but one in which the United States has very successfully integrated the second tier powers uh, uh, voluntarily into this system, a very uh, functional uh, global hierarchy uh, that has been mainly to their advantage as well as the American advantage, and even managed to integrate uh, um, countries in the third and even fourth tiers of the economy, uh, global economy uh, rather successfully, uh, especially since uh, the neoliberal revolution of the late, early 1980s. Um, They've, uh, I think, uh, managed things um, from their point of view very, very well. And uh, I find that uh, Leo Panitch and Sam Gindin's relevant new book, uh, The Making of the Global Economy, makes this point uh, very carefully and well. Uh, I blurred the cover, uh, but I mean every word of what I said in that, that blurb. Uh, and that's not just the matter of economic power. The U.S. has uh, exercised very successfully over the last five or six decades, but uh, cultural power, uh, the creation of the whole model of consumer capitalism, um, the, the remaking of the, to, to steal that quote from Margaret Thatcher, the remaking the soul through neoliberalism. Uh, I think it's been a, a fairly su a successful project. First, in, in the early decades, the 50s and 60s, there's certainly a lot of challenges in the 70s, but the reconstruction of that power in the 80s and 90s, I thought is about as impressive as, as anything you get in this real world. Now, you can make a list of problems with this and that, problems with the management of the dollar, problems with the management of the empire, but, you know, not all problems are fatal problems. Uh, and uh, he made the apple, we live in a fallen world, and uh, nothing ever works perfectly. But I think uh, American policymakers have been, by and large, very, very successful in remaking the world in their own image and uh, continuing to keep it uh, disciplined. I think even now, um, although certainly American power is uh, not as, as, as unitary as it was in the early post-World War II years, uh, still uh, quite substantial uh, to the point where I think even the, the Chinese are not yet willing uh, to challenge it in any significant way. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, uh, I think uh, the uh, uh, it's easy to overdo the stories of American decline, uh, both politically and economically. Um, I was thinking of that quote from John Connolly, Nixon's Treasury Secretary. Uh, it may be our currency, but it's your problem. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the U.S. has been very good at making uh, our problems other people's problems over the years. Um, as for the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the value of the dollar over the years, um, it, did, uh, it rose in the crisis. Uh, the, the crisis of 2008-2009, which is an interesting thing. It meant that even though this global economic crisis can be uh, traced in its most immediate terms to the United States, uh, the reaction of a lot of the capitalists around the world was to send money here when things started looking rocky. Uh, because for all the problems in the United States, it still has the most political and economic stability of any major pole in the global economy. Uh, I remember certainly in the late 80s when Japan was going to eat our lunch and set us the bill for it. Um, they, uh, uh, that, that Japan now has had 20, more than 20 years of, of, of very serious stagnation and its uh, international ambitions have uh, really uh, shrunk dramatically. There was a period where we thought the euro was going to rise as, a, uh, as an alternative uh, 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 currency, a reserve currency, uh, and that the EU was going to become sort of alternative state structure to rival American power, and uh, now that all looks uh, rather rocky. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the rivalry uh, for the dollar central world a lot more problematic than ever. And certainly uh, the uh, Chinese currency is nowhere near uh, ready for prime time in, in, in international terms. Uh, now, despite the, uh, you can point to that the chart of the dollar, uh, the dollar's value, if we go back to uh, when it begins around 1973, it's 20, that's against the major currencies of the world, that is. 
uh, meaning mostly the rich countries of Western Europe, uh, Japan, uh, Australia. Uh, that's down about 20% since 1973, uh, which is a decline, but certainly not a, a collapse. Uh, if you look at the Federal Reserve's broader index, uh, which includes uh, 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 some of the richer uh, uh, countries of the so-called developing world, uh, that index begins around 1994, and uh, the value of the dollar is up 5%, I guess, that broader index over the last 20 years or so. So this really seems like hardly a picture of a currency in some sort of critical decline. Uh, the idea of the BRICS uh, as some sort of rising rival of coal um, is an interesting term because the, the concept of the BRICS of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and somehow South Africa has gotten tagged up in that lately, uh, was invented by Goldman Sachs economist Jim O'Neill uh, as a marketing concept. Uh, so it doesn't really have any kind of political coherence. Brazil, uh, Brazilian capitalists don't like Chinese capitalists and think they're stepping on their toes. I want to protect themselves against it. Uh, there's really no any kind of internal political coherence to that, uh, and uh, it's ironic that uh, the whole concept was put into circulation by Goldman Sachs, which remains uh, remarkably powerful despite uh, recent problems. Now, as for Alan's um, uh, contribution, I have very carefully stayed away from getting involved in all those value controversies, and, uh, falling rate of profit stuff. Uh, the Kleinman versus Mosley fights and all that stuff. It just all gives me a headache, and I think it's a, a great diversion uh, for uh, people to spend so much time. Uh, it seems kind of a scholastic and kind of real payoff to me. Mm. Other people differ. But um, I'm always very suspicious of concepts that adjust profits to tell a different story from what we can see from uh, most uh, standard bourgeois data. Uh, I don't understand what a rate of profit means if it's not been observable, observable or enjoyed or coveted by any real world capitalist. Now if you ask just about any real world capitalist what's been happening to profitability over the last 20, 30 years, I think they're most of them pretty happy. Uh, the, uh, I think the rate of profit by conventional measures, the share of profit in GDP uh, rose very dramatically from the early 1980s into the crisis of 2000 fell back a bit uh, and has now recovered very nicely. Uh, so from the point of view of American capitalists, uh, they're doing very, very well. They're very happy. Uh, their personal income has risen dramatically. Their personal wealth has risen dramatically. And uh, corporate balance sheets are just fat with, uh, with cash. Uh, they don't really feel any experience. They don't feel any decline at all. Uh, so I don't understand uh, what um, uh, any kind of adjustment to that uh, that uh, that perception on the part of the capitalist class uh, uh, delivers us analytically or politically. Um, that the chapter of Marx uh, re outlined uh, the falling rate of profit. The chapter afterwards is called countervailing tendencies. That part is though it seems to be forgotten. But there are plenty of countervailing tendencies to the falling rate of profit. But my question is, um, after uh, reacting to both presentations. Where does all this talk of decline lead us? What conclusion do we draw from that? Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm skeptical about these areas of great decline. Uh, I think the possibilities of recovery are always there. Uh, and in many ways, we're following the normal trajectory of the economy after the major financial crisis. Uh, and we probably, uh, by that trajectory, we have another two or three years to go before we turn into something like normal, whatever that means. But um, this, this narrative of long decline since the early 1970s, since the early 1970s what, what conclusion do we draw from that? Is the system on its last legs? Is uh, there anything that can be done about it? What does that mean? Uh, in other words, uh, so what, I guess, is, uh, is, is the question I have for uh, the decline of the battle. Thanks.